So today's video is focused on the Hardy-Weinberg principle. Okay? And so the Hardy-Weinberg principle states that our frequencies of our alleles in a population are not going to change unless evolutionary forces are acting on the population. Okay, so again, we've got our frequencies of our alleles. So how often we're going to see the allele in the population should not change unless evolution is happening on the population. And this cannot be applied to every population. For the Hardy-Weinberg principle to be able to be applied, certain conditions have to be met. Okay, first of all, there has to be a large population size. If the population size is not large, then um, there's not enough... Uh, basically, there's not enough alleles available in the gene pool for this. So uh, there has to be a large population size. There has to be uh, random mating. Okay, so by random mating, we mean that there is no selection for a mate. One mate is not better than the other. Organisms in the population are completely random. They do not care who is their mate. Uh, in addition to that, the population can have no mutations. If there are mutations in the population, then the alleles are changing. We know that. Okay? If, there's if there's mutations going on in the population, we're altering the DNA, so it's going to be evolving. Okay? So there can't be any, um, any mutations happening in the population. Okay? The population also can't have any natural selection occurring in the population. Um, in addition to no mate selection, you know, the fact there has to be random mating, there cannot be any uh, natural selection due to the environment. In the example we looked at in class with the different colored elk, okay, um, or with the peppered moths or the insect resistance, okay, there can't be any natural selection. No character, no one character can be favored over another. Okay? And the last thing is there cannot be any gene flow. And by gene flow, we mean uh, migration, basically. There can't be organisms moving out of the population because then some of your alleles and genes are leaving. And there can't be organisms moving into the population because then we've got, um, again, another change in the alleles. So there can't be any gene flow. Okay, so if you think about this, this is not, you know, not a situation we're really going to find in nature, that it's a large population that no mutations are happening in, that there's totally random mating, and that there's no natural selection happening, and they're so isolated that there's no migration either in or out. Okay, but if these conditions are met, then the allele frequency should stay the same. And so if we calculate allele frequencies at various times, we can see that if it has changed, then the population has evolved. So we have two equations that can be used to calculate this. Okay, we've got p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. And then we have p plus q equals 1. Okay, so we will use these two combinations uh, together to help us determine the frequencies of these alleles. And so these equations give us allele frequencies, genotype frequencies, and phenotype frequencies. So let's look at the P and Q first. Okay, so P is my frequency of the dominant allele. So for instance here, we're talking about big A. Okay, how often in the population am I going to see big A? It doesn't matter if it's a big A, big A. It doesn't matter if it's heterozygous, big A, little a. How many times am I going to see that big A? I'm going to see it two times in the homozygous dominant um, genotype and one time in the heterozygous. Q, then, would be my frequency of recessive alleles. So, for example, how often am I going to see little a in the population? Okay, that's what my Q is equal to. So my P and my Q all by themselves, they're equal to the frequency of alleles. P is our dominant allele, Q is our recessive allele. We can also determine genotype frequencies then. And that's using this equation up here. P squared is my frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype. How many alleles are in a genotype? Well, remember, I've got two alleles in each genotype, right? So my homozygous dominant genotype is big A, big A, or big B, big B, or big F, big F, whatever letter it is that we're using. So my frequency of my homozygous dominant genotype. So P squared is how often I see big A, big A together, okay? And because I have two alleles here, then I have 
by 2. Okay, that's how I can remember which is which. P squared is a genotype. It's going to have two alleles. Plain old P is how often I see the homozygous, uh, how often I see the dominant allele. No homozygous, no heterozygous, because homozygous and heterozygous means that we have to have two of them. Okay, so that means then that Q squared would be my frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype. So, for instance, little a, little a. Okay, again, my genotype has two alleles in it, so I'm using my Q squared, okay, where that has a two in it. When I see the two, I need to be thinking a genotype. It's got two alleles, genotype. So Q is how often I see little a all by itself. Doesn't matter if it's in the heterozygous genotype or the homozygous recessive genotype. And then Q squared is how often I see two little a's together, which then leaves me with uh, 2PQ. So 2PQ then would be the frequency of our heterozygous genotype. So for example, big A, little a. Okay. I've got a dominant allele, P, a recessive allele, Q, right? P, Q, and then it's a genotype, so I have to have my two, right? So 2PQ is the frequency of a heterozygous genotype. It is very important that you understand when you're doing a Hardy-Weinberg problem what exactly you're looking for and what exactly you need to, uh, what exactly you know. Okay, so the information that was given to you in the problem and what exactly it is you're trying to solve for. Always write that down and so that you know, am I looking for P squared? Am I looking for Q squared? 2PQ? Because what you're going to be doing in these problems, you're going to be looking for a portion of this equation. Asking you how many heterozygotes do you have or what's the frequency of the recessive allele. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Let's look at this problem here, because this is how you'll see most of your Heidi Weinberg problems in a word problem format. So it tells us here that I've got the frequency of recessive homozygotes with cystic fibrosis is 0 .0048. Calculate the frequency of the recessive allele, the dominant allele, and the heterozygotes. So I'm going to start first, where you should always start with what exactly it is that you n need to know. So I need to know the frequency of my recessive allele. That's Q. I'm looking for Q. I want to know the frequency of the dominant allele. So I'm looking for P. And then the heterozygotes, which is 2PQ. So these are the things that I'm looking for a, in my equation. I know that the frequency of recessive homozygotes, so little a, little a, with cystic fibrosis is 0 0.0048. Okay, well, little a, little a genotype is equal to Q squared. And so I know I see that 0 0.0048 or 0.48% of the time. So the frequency of the recessive homozygotes or Q squared is 0 0.0048. Now it's algebra, right? If I know that Q squared is equal to 0 0.048 and I want to find Q, well, I take the square root of both sides of the equation. So the square root of uh, 0 0.0048 is 0 0.069. And that gives me Q. Okay, so now I know that Q is 0 0.069. And I can now use that information to find P. Okay, so I know that this is Q. Okay, and remember I have two equations. Remember I have P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1. And I also have P plus Q equals 1. Well, based on your algebra knowledge, if I know Q, I can easily solve for P, right? P plus 0 0.069 equals 1. When I do the same thing to both sides of the equation, I can isolate P all by itself. 
And so P is 0 0.931. So now I've solved for P and I've solved for Q. And now I just need to plug that in to find my heterozygotes. Okay, 2PQ then would be 2 times 0 0.069 times 0.931. which is going to give me 0.128, and I'm all set. Once I know what I'm solving for and what I've been given, I can very easily just algebra plug and play away. Let's do two more examples. This time I'm given information about um, a disease, phenylketonuria. Okay, it's found within humans and is carried on the recessive allele. So it's carried on that little a, recessive allele. PKU occurs in one out of every 10,000 births. Okay, and what we're going to be doing for this is we're going to be calculating the frequency of alleles, carriers, and people that do not have PKU. Okay, so first things first, let's write down what exactly it is that we are looking for. We're looking for the frequencies of the alleles. So I'm looking for P. I'm looking for Q. I want to know carriers. Well, carriers are heterozygote, right? So I want 2PQ. And I want to know people that do not actually have PKU. There should be a U on the end there. We're missing that U. Okay. And so people that actually, that do not have PKU. Again, it told you in the top here that this is a recessive disorder. So if somebody does not have it, then those people are either big A, big A, or big A, little a. They can be a carrier, but they don't actually have it. So if I want to know these people combined, then I am also, in addition to looking for P, Q, and 2 P, Q, I am looking for P squared. Remember, P squared is big A, big A, plus 2 P, Q. That's going to give me the people that do the frequency of the people that do not have PKU. So these are all the things I am looking for. So let's figure out what I know. I know that it's a recessive allele. Okay, it's carried on the recessive allele. And I know that one out of every 10,000 people have it. Okay, so let's look at this problem. I have a population of 832 white sheep and 251 black sheep. The black allele is recessive to the white allele. Calculate the frequency of the dominant allele and each genotype. Now imagine your population grows to 2,500 sheep and remains in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. How many of this new population will be black and how many sheep will be white? Okay, so let's start first. Let's start with just the stuff here in the beginning. Okay, so I am going to start here by calculating my frequency of the dominant allele which is P. Okay, so I need to know the frequency of the dominant allele in each genotype. Okay, so I know that P squared is equal to the homozygous dominant genotype. 2PQ is my heterozygotes, and Q squared is my homozygous recessive. Okay, I also know that I have 832 white sheep okay, and 251 black sheep. And I know that black is recessive to white. So I need to know, by knowing that I have black sheep, I know that they have to be homozygous recessive, right? I know they have to be that genotype. To look recessive, you have to have the recessive genotype. So I'm going to start there. I like to start with Q squared. It's so, it's the place you need to be starting. I know that 251 out of my whole population are black. So 251 out of my entire population. That's going to be how often I'm going to see the homozygous recessive genotype. Okay? So my entire population consists of 1,083 sheep. Okay, and so if 251 of those are homozygous recessive, then the frequency of my Q squared here is 0.232. Okay, great. Well, I'm not looking for Q squared. 
But now that I know Q squared, I can find Q, right? Square root of everything. Okay, so when I take the square root of 0.232, I get 0.482. Remember, I have my two equations, P plus Q equals 1. Okay, so I can plug in my Q value there. And I can determine now that P is equal to 0.518. All right, I plug in my 0.482, subtract 0.482 from both sides of the equation, and I get P. Okay, finally, I found something I was looking for. Okay, so I know that P is 0.58. Okay, if I want to find P squared, well, then I just need to square my P value. All right, so 0.518 squared gives me 0.268. So now I know P squared, which is my homozygous dominant genotype. That's how often I see that. Now I can plug in into my 2PQ to find my heterozygous, how often I see my heterozygous genotype. 2 times 0.482 times 0.2. 518. Got to make sure you're always using the right, whether, you know, you don't use Q squared when you should use Q. Okay, so in this case, I should have 2 times point two times point four eight two times point five one eight, okay, which gives me 0.499. Okay, so 2PQ. And then I did need to know Q squared which was 0.232. And when I add these guys up here, right, they should add up to 1 if I wanted to check my work. Okay, so I've done the first part. I've calculated the frequency of the dominant allele, and I've calculated each genotype. Now I need to deal with the second part here. I've got my population has grown to 2,500 sheep and remains in Hardy-Weiberg e equilibrium. So that means evolution is not happening, not happening on this population, and the allele frequencies should not change. So how many of this new population will be black and how many will be white? Well, based on my genotypes, I know that little a, little a genotype will be black, right? And I know that big A, big A, and big A, little a will look white, right? So if I know little a, little a is Q squared, so I know that 0.232, or 23.2% of the time, right? I can change that to a percent. I can multiply it by 100. 23.2% of the time, they're going to look black. Well, now I just need to find what 23.2% of 2,500 is. Right, so if I had, you could do all your cross multiplying, but you also hopefully you know that if you just take your frequency, multiply it by your total, you're going to determine that about 580 of these new sheep will look black. Now I want to know how many are going to look white. Okay, so if I want to determine how many are going to look white, Okay, then I need to determine how many are going, the frequency, I'm going to see these two genotypes, big A, big A, and big A, little a. Well, that's P squared plus 2PQ. So that is 0 0.767, 76.7% of the time, they're going to look white. So again, I apply that to my population, right? 0 0.767 times 2,500 gives me about 1,918 sheep. Okay, so I get about 1,918 sheep. Okay, and out of my 2,500 will look white. Okay, and so that's how you're going to solve Hardy-Weinberg problems, and we will practice these in class.